My name is Dr. Shadi Hassan. I'm a senior treatment plan and consultant, and I've been working with 3D Diagnostics for the past six years. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, and most importantly, introduce you to Dr. Chris Haggerty. Haggerty and I have been working very closely for the past three years, planning hundreds of cases varying from a simple one implant procedure all the way to a more complex full arch rehabilitation cases. Dr. Haggerty is an oral maxillofacial surgeon whose practice has an emphasis on dental implants and reconstructive surgery. He's an accomplished lecturer and an author of his own textbook called Atlas of Operative and Oral Maxillofacial Surgery that is currently being printed in five different languages. Today's presentation will focus on virtual surgical planning for the placement of dental implants for locator type attachments. Topics discussed will include locator treatment planning, implant placement with the use of custom surgical guides, bone reduction guides, and complication management. I would like to welcome you again and thank you for joining us today. There will be a live Q&A session following this lecture, so please feel free to use the chat box down below to ask any question. With that being said, Dr. Haggerty, mic is all yours. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for that great introduction, and thanks to 3D Diagnostic for giving me this opportunity to discuss an implant solution that is very common in my practice, the use of locator attachments. What is a locator? A locator is an abutment or attachment that is similar to a snap on a jacket. Locator abutments allow for a simple and affordable means to greatly enhance the stability and retention of a new or pre-existing removable prosthesis. Locators offer enhanced patient satisfaction, are user-friendly, and are very simple to restore. Although locator abutments are advertised to allow for 40 degrees of implant divergence correction, implants should be placed with no more than 20 degrees of divergence to allow for easier patient prosthesis seating and to minimize accelerated wear and tear of the locator retention rings and locator housings. The different colors of the locator retention rings correlate to different retention forces and angulation corrections. Thus, locators are very forgiving and customizable to various clinical situations. As the locator retention rings do wear over time, it is recommended that they are evaluated and replaced annually. How many locator abutments do you need for a stable prosthesis? The minimum number of implants for the mandible is two. Due to the poor bone quality of the posterior maxilla, the minimum number of implants and locators for the maxilla is four. Equally as important as implant number is implant position. Implants should be placed to minimize anterior posterior rocking forces and to allow for cross arch stabilization of the prosthesis. I prefer the placement of five implants per arch to allow for an equal distribution of the forces along the edentulous arch, cross arch stabilization, enhanced stability of the prosthesis, and in the event that one of the implants fails over time, the patient will still have a functional prosthesis. If an anterior implant is planned, it should offset the midline as this is the thinnest portion of acrylic in the mandibular denture and is prone to fracture. Midline maxillary implants or implants in the maxillary central incisor locations are also not recommended as they are typically in close proximity to the incisive canal and the increased thickness of the anterior maxillary denture may lead to patient aesthetics and phonetic issues. Sufficient vertical restorative space must be present depending on the type of restorative prosthesis. <clears throat> as locator abutments enjoy a very low profile, they are ideal in clinical situations with average or less than average intra-arch spacing. Only nine millimeters of vertical restorative space is required for locator attachments. There are multiple ways to work up an edentulous arch for implant placement. However, the simplest and most time efficient means is with the use of fiducial markers to create an STL file for exportation. Let's review a few cases. This is Dan. Dan is a 65-year-old gentleman that has been battling severe periodontal disease for the past 20 years. 
Dan is interested in a stable, predictable, and affordable means to replace his failing maxillary and mandibular teeth. Here we have a reformatted Panorex that demonstrates severe periodontal disease with gross vertical bone loss. Dan has terminal dentition. Dan's teeth are extracted and grafting is performed. The patient is placed within immediate maxillary and mandibular conventional dentures to allow time for the bone grafts to consolidate and to decrease the periodontal bacteria within his oral cavity. The patient's maxillary and mandibular dentures will be used for the patient's implant workup. Dentures are also an ideal means to establish the ideal VDO lip projection and to establish the ideal aesthetics of the final restoration in respects to tooth show, tooth size and shape, and tooth and gingival color. Fiducial stickers are placed on the palatal and buccal surfaces of the maxillary complete denture and on the lingual and the buccal aspect of the mandibular denture. A radiolucent reline is performed to allow for a precise fitting denture with a 100% fit of the intaglio surfaces of the dentures to the dentulous arches. The radiolucent tissue conditioner is placed and fitted to the intaglio and palatal surfaces. A CT scan is taken with the maxillary and mandibular dentures in place to create a DICOM file for exportation. Note the fiducial reference markers on the CT scan. The maxillary and the mandibular dentures are removed from the patient's oral cavity and the dentures are scanned individually with a CT scanner to create STL files for exportation. The DICAM and STL files are merged in a 3D layered environment to allow for the case to be worked up for guided implant placement. The maxillary denture outline is shown here in green. Note the ideal adaptation of the intaglio surface of the denture to the soft tissues. Any voids between the denture and the soft tissue will result in guide fitting inaccuracies and implant placement errors. Implant number four is planned to have a slight buccal angulation due to the morphology of the anterior maxillary bone. Implant number six is planned to emerge through the occlusal palatal surface of the denture, as this will be the ideal location for the locator housings. Implant number 11 is placed parallel to implant number six to allow for a similar path of insertion for the future removable prosthesis. Implant number 13 is placed slightly more palatal due to the morphology of the posterior maxillary bone. Remember, locators do allow for some degree of flexibility with implant angulation. Note that all implants will be placed in solid bone with at least 1.5 millimeters of surrounding bone with sufficient Hounsfield units. A 3D rendition of the complete denture with fiducial markers and the four maxillary implants in place. The maxillary implants are placed as parallel as possible to allow for a similar path of insertion of the future prosthesis. Implant location correlates with the ideal position of the locator housings for ideal form and function. In this case, the implant divergence is limited to 10 degrees or less. To some extent, the anterior alveolar bone dictates the angulation of the implants. Tapered implants do aid in anterior maxillary implant placement. The mandibular implants are worked up to have a similar path of insertion to allow for a maximum AP spread and to avoid anatomical structures such as the mental nerve and mandibular nerve canal. A custom surgical guide is designed based upon the implant workup. Here is Dan's post-operative film. Implant placement correlates ideally with the implant workup. As sinus lifting was not indicated, the distal location of the maxillary implants was determined by the location of the bilateral maxillary sinuses. After six weeks of healing, 
The implants are torque tested to ensure optimal strength and osseo integration prior to the placement of locator abutments. A CT scan was taken after six weeks of healing to assess for implant integration and to allow for assessing actual versus virtual implant location. The scan was also used to measure the height of the tissues around each implant to determine the necessary height of the locator abutments. Actual versus virtual implant placement was less than two degrees different. Note virtual locator attachment placement on the mandibular implants. Based on the workup, the size and height of the mandibular and maxillary locators is determined. Final maxillary and mandibular locator abutments in place. Maxillary and mandibular dentures with locator housings and locator retention rings in place. Final happy patient with a locator supported removable maxillary and mandibular prosthesis in place. Placing mandibular implants with an alveo reduction guide. This is Don. Don is a 58 year old male that has been edentulous for over 20 years. Don has a poor fitting mandibular denture due to decades of disuse atrophy of his mandible. Don has been informed by several dental specialists that he has insufficient bone volume for implant placement. Note that his extreme bone atrophy has allowed the mental nerves to exit the alveolar ridge in a crestal position. Here is the patient's current complete mandibular denture. The mandibular denture is relined and fiducial markers are placed. The lower denture is scanned to create an STL file. The STL and DICOM files are merged in a 3D layered environment and Don's case is planned for four parallel mandibular implants. Four skeletal fixation pins are designed to hold the guide in place during his implant surgery. Between four and seven millimeters of vertical bone reduction will be required to place the implants in solid bone and at a similar platform level. Here is the dentulous mandibular ridge at the time of surgery. A mandibular denture guide is placed to allow for the placement of skeletal fixation pins. The fit of this guide correlates with the fit of the mandibular denture during the workup phase. After skeletal fixation pins are drilled, the guide based on the denture replication is removed. A full thickness mucoperiosteal tissue flap bisecting the keratinized tissue is elevated to expose the mandibular alveolar crest and buccal and lingual flange in the areas of proposed implant placement. Note the knife edge mandibular ridge. Care is taken to place the incision through the keratinized tissue for the overall periodontal health of the future implants. A single 3-0 silk suture is a simple means to retract the lingual tissue from the surgical site during implant placement. The alveoplasty reduction guide is placed and secured using the pre-drilled skeletal fixation pins. Guide accuracy and seating is confirmed based on how the guide articulates with the lingual surface of the mandible. In this case, note the ideal guide adaptation to the lingual bone. Alveoplasty is completed using a large round burr with copious irrigation. Note aggressive and planned vertical reduction of bone in order to obtain a flat and uniform level of bone for implant placement. Between four and eight millimeters of vertical bone was reduced. With the alveoplasty guide in place and secured to the mandible with the skeletal fixation pins, the implant guide is fixated to the alveoplasty guide. Implant osteotomies are performed through the implant guide based on the virtual surgical workup. The custom implant guide allows for precise implant placement with angulation control. The horizontal markers on the implant placement adapter allow the practitioner to control the exact depth of implant placement. Mandibular implants are placed through the implant guide the implant guide is removed to show the ideal position of the mandibular implants in relation to the narrow mandibular alveolar ridge. 
stock healing abutments are placed, and the soft tissues are closed in a tension-free manner using 4-0 chromic sutures. If the mentalis muscle is stripped, it is important to reapproximate it with 3-0 vicral sutures. Detailed suturing techniques are required to allow for the healing abutments to emerge through keratinized tissue. A CT scan orthopantomogram depicting ideal implant spacing and parallelism. Note that the distal implants are placed five millimeters anterior to the mental foramen bilaterally. The patient presents two weeks status post implant placement with a small wound dehiscence. Such wound dehiscences are common in the severely atrophic anterior mandible due to the pull of the mentalis muscle. The wound is treated with saltwater rinses and oral antibiotics should the site become secondarily infected. The patient presents six weeks status post implant placement with total tissue healing and ideal implant osseointegration. The pre-existing mandibular denture in this case was retrofit with locator housings. This is Paul. Paul is an 80-year-old male with a chief complaint that his lower RPD is terrible and he hates wearing it. Paul's dentist states that his remaining mandibular teeth are terminal. Paul desires an affordable means to replace his teeth and to function ideally. Implants are planned to be at the same platform level. Significant alveoplasty is necessary on the anterior implant. Five implants are planned with, planned with simultaneous tooth extraction and alveoplasty. Implants are planned to be in the ideal position for mandibular locator housings and are spaced to maximize the implant's anterior, posterior, or AP spread. All posterior implants are perfectly parallel. Due to the angulation of the anterior mandibular buccal plate, the most anterior implant is slightly angled forward. In this case, total implant divergence is less than 10 degrees. A custom guide is fabricated to be a partial tooth supported, partial soft tissue supported guide. Skeletal fixation pins are planned to allow for greater guide stability and implant placement accuracy. Here is the lower arch prior to surgery. The surgical guide is placed, and this is an image showing it prior to the placement of skeletal fixation pins. Implants are placed in a flapless fashion through the surgical guide. Implant placement confirmation film depicting ideal implant placement. No areas of required bone reduction due to the depth of implant placement. The remaining mandibular teeth are extracted atraumatically. A full thickness mucoperiosteal tissue flap is created and planned alveoplasty is performed based on the implant platform locations. Grafting will not be performed to the tooth extraction sites. Stock healing abutments are placed and the mucoperiosteal tissue flap is closed. The mandibular denture has been soft relined to allow for the patient to wear them comfortably during the healing period. The intaglio surface has been relined to minimize axial pressure on the implants during the first weeks of healing. A four week post operative film shows ideal implant placement and healing of the extraction sites. Patients are scheduled after three to four weeks to assess for oral hygiene and the tissue condition around the healing abutments. At this four week visit, one of the healing abutments had become loose. The tissue was trimmed and the healing abutment was replaced. After eight weeks of healing, note the ideal soft tissue contours and implant integration. Here's a three-year follow-up of Paul with his locator abutments. His three-year post-operative film shows ideal implant position with no crestal bone loss and no implant pathology. This is Michael. Michael is a 68-year-old male with terminal dentition due to advanced periodontal disease. Michael is concerned about having loose dentures and is interested in implants. 
He is also interested in the option of a palateless removable prosthesis. Michael's teeth are extracted and the sites are grafted. He is placed into immediate maxillary and mandibular dentures for three months while the bone grafts consolidate. Fiducial markers are placed and his dentures are scanned. The mandibular implants are planned to emerge in the second premolar and canine regions. All implants are planned parallel so that the prosthesis will insert with a single path of insertion. The implants are angled forward slightly due to the angulation of the buccal plate of bone. The implants have zero degrees of divergence. The mandibular implants are emerging through the lingual aspect and cingulums of the lower denture, as this will be the most ideal location for the locator housings. The maxillary implants are planned in the premolar, canine, and lateral incisor location. If the patient elects for a palateless prosthesis, either six implants for locators or four implants for a custom bar are required. Implants are not placed in the central incisor location as this can interfere with the aesthetics of the final denture and the phonation of the patient. All implants are parallel and have a similar path of insertion as dictated by the angulation of the facial plate of bone. Ideal location of future locator abutment housings. Ideal cross arch stabilization and maximum AP spread of both upper and lower implants. Here we can see the locations and angulations of the mandibular implants, which are angled facially due to the occlusal surface of the denture. All implants are placed at the same platform level to minimize the adverse torsional and bending effects of taller locator abutments and are placed superior to the mental nerve canal. All maxillary implants are centered in solid bone and stop just short of the maxillary sinuses. Due to the poor bone quality within the posterior maxilla, larger diameter implants are used for additional locator strength and support. The mandibular and maxillary surgical guides are fabricated with skeletal fixation pins for enhanced guide stability. Here are the edentulous arches prior to surgery. The guides are placed and skeletal fixation pins are drilled and engaged solid native bone. Implants are placed in a flapless fashion through the surgical guides. A six millimeter tissue punch is used to remove tissue surrounding each implant prior to the placement of stock healing abutments. Six millimeter diameter stock healing abutments are used to shape the tissue prior to locator abutment impressions. Pressure indicating paste or alginate is used to identify the exact position of the healing abutments immediately after implant placement. The intaglio surface of the dentures are marked with a round burr and a slow speed handpiece. The sites of the implants are relieved to minimize pressure on the implants as they heal. A soft reline will be performed for patient comfort and improved denture fit immediate post-op Panorex film. Note that the location of implant number 12 is different from the implant workup. It appears to be seated more apically within the Panorex film. Implant number 12 had a very low torque value due to the soft bone and was immediately replaced with a larger diameter implant. The primary stability of the implants as dictated by the insertional torque value is a predictor of implant success. Implants with a low insertional torque value have a significantly lower survival rate than implants with a higher insertional torque value. All implants are spaced ideally for maximum anterior posterior spread and cross arch stabilization. All implants are parallel for a single uniform path of insertion for the future maxillary and mandibular removable prosthesis. 
the removable dentures established an ideal VDO for this case prior to implant placement. Here we have Michael at a five-year follow-up. Here we can see his mandible with his locator attachments in place and with his removable lower denture. Here we have his maxilla with his six implants and locators and his upper complete denture. Here's a final picture of Michael. Here we have a happy patient with excellent denture retention. When working up guided maxillary implant cases, please note that severely divergent implants do not work in the maxilla. The softer maxillary bone is not capable of withstanding the same forces as a denser mandibular bone when it comes to locator angulation. For implants with significant divergence, a custom milled bar is recommended to provide cross arch stabilization and implant splinting. In this example, angled zygomatic implants and straight anterior maxillary implants are stabilized through the use of a bar. Ideal maxillary surgical guide fit should allow for even contact on the alveolar ridge and the palatal tissues. Note symmetrical tissue blanching with the guide in place and skeletal fixation pins in position. This is Charlene. Charlene is a 72-year-old edentulous female desiring a removable palateless maxillary prosthesis with, as she says, extra retention. Fiducial markers are placed on her pre-existing maxillary denture. The maxillary denture is relined and scanned for the exportation of an STL file to begin her implant workup. Here we have her edentulous ridge prior to surgery. Her surgical guide is in place. Implants are placed in a flapless fashion with an intentional 12 degrees of divergence. The implant sites and stock healing abutments in place immediately after surgery. After six weeks of healing, the implants are osseointegrated and a custom bar is fabricated to allow for a palateless prosthesis and maximum retention. Care is taken when planning a case for a bar to allow for, for sufficient VDO as a bar prosthesis has a higher profile than locator attachments. This is another interesting case. This is William. William is a 58-year-old male who presents for maxillary implant evaluation. William already has implants on the lower with locators and he's very happy with his lower prosthesis and the retention associated with it. William's dentist has fabricated a maxillary denture with a metal framework to withstand the parafunctional forces of William's clenching and grinding. The maxillary denture fits over his remaining maxillary teeth that have been damaged from his years of bruxism. The patient's maxillary RPD with a metal framework that will not allow for the creation of an STL file due to the scatter from the metal framework. Due to this, the decision was made to work up William's case with only a DICOM file and to create a bone-supported surgical guide. The case is planned for four maxillary implants. And again, there is no STL file, only a DICOM file in this case. The implants are designed with no tissue references and no denture reference in place. Here's the maxilla prior to surgery. Note the V-shaped ridge and deep palatal vault. His remaining root tips were extracted prior to surgery to allow for hard and soft tissue healing of the surgical sites prior to implant placement. A full thickness mucoperiosteal tissue flap is reflected from the first molar to the first molar region. A silk suture is used to retract the palatal tissues away from the alveolar process of bone. The surgical guide is secured and rests directly on the alveolar and palatal bone. Note that the guide is 100% bone supported. 
Failure to rest the guide completely on the bone will result in a non-seated guide and gross implant placement errors. The implant osteotomies are drilled and the surgical guide is removed. Parallel pins are placed to confirm osteotomy position and the depth and to demonstrate ideal spacing, symmetry, and parallelism of the implant osteotomy sites. The implants are placed. Here we can see the implant transfer assemblies. All implants are 100% covered in bone and with minimal implant divergence. Stock healing abutments are in place. Here is a post-operative film after the use of the bone-supported surgical guide and implant placement. At 12 months follow-up, the implants are ideally spaced and the locator abutments are in place with pink and healthy keratinized tissue. Due to the very deep palatal vault, 100% palatal coverage was not possible in this case. Do we need fiducial markers if we have some teeth? This is Ellen. Ellen has a chief complaint that her lower partial does not fit very well and it's causing pain and irritation to her gums. Her anterior teeth are in great condition and do not need to be extracted. An itero is obtained to, an itero is used to obtain a digital impression. The itero is then exported in the form of an STL file to work up Ellen's case. Implants are planned at least 2.5 millimeters superior to the mental and inferior alveolar nerves for locator abutments. Implants are planned at least 1.5 millimeters away from the lingual plate of bone. The posterior implants are six millimeter length tissue level implants. The implant length is determined by the proximity to the mandibular canal. The anterior implants are eight millimeter tall bone level implants. The implants are planned to emerge through the occlusal table of the pre-existing RPD. The implants are planned parallel and at a similar platform height. A custom model and surgical guide is fabricated. Prior to surgery, it is always a good idea to compare the fit of the surgical guide on the model, as this is how the guide will fit the patient at the time of surgery. The implant guide will be partial tooth supported and partial tissue supported. The surgical site prior to implant placement Implants are placed in a flapless fashion. Stock healing abutments are placed. Axial CT scan depicting ideal implant placement. Actual versus virtual implant placement. Note implant number 19 was switched to a larger diameter implant due to a low insertional torque value. In this case, it was not possible to place a longer implant due to the proximity of the implant to the inferior alveolar nerve. Anterior implants, actual versus virtual comparison. Note the extreme accuracy of the surgical guide. Posterior implant comparison. Note maintenance of 2.5 millimeters from the inferior alveolar nerve as a surgical guide also controls the exact depth of implant osteotomy and of implant placement. The pre-existing mandibular RPD is retrofitted to accept locator attachments. The locator abutments are in place. The RPD with increased retention and improved comfort is in position. And in the end, we have a very happy patient with increased comfort and increased stability to her mandibular removable RPD thanks to locator attachments. I hope that this lecture has illustrated the many benefits to dental locators and to guided implant surgery.
I would like to think I would like to thank 3D Diagnostic for allowing me the opportunity to provide this lecture. For those of you interested in learning more about the specialty of oral and maxillofacial surgery, please check out my book on Amazon. In the next nine months, a second edition with expanded dental implant and bone grafting coverage will be available. Thank you again for your time and for your attention this afternoon. And shortly, myself and Dr. Hassan will be available for an open question and answer period. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Haggerty, for the uh, very informative lecture. I um, guess we have a question here. Um, there's a question that says regarding the maxillary and the mandibular implants projections, um, should they be planned for the occlusive forces be falling perpendicular on their platform or are they only to retain the denture and occlusive forces are distributed on the prosthesis themselves? So, Well, I mean, that's a very good question and I wanna answer it in two parts. In the ideal world, you would always like to have the implants axially loaded. I think that it gives the implants the best means to distribute the, the masticatory forces. However, you also wanna have the implants emerging through the part of the denture that's gonna be the thickest so that that's where your locator housings can be. So it'll be a compromise between where the locator housings will be and actually distributing the force through the implant. Okay. Um, we do have another question from Dr. Moore. It says, some research does not support the use of locator-supported dentures in the maxillary arch. What are your thoughts on this? Well, that's a very good question, Dr. Moore. Um, a lot of the earlier research showed that the use of two or three implants in the maxilla for locators was not appropriate. Uh, whereas you can do two or three locators in the mandible. We've learned that by appropriate implant placement, we can place locators in the maxilla, kind of as we briefly discussed in the discussion, uh, a lot of the specialists feel as though you need a minimum of four maxillary implants. Again, those implants need to be placed very parallel. They need to be placed in bone that has the appropriate density or Hounsfield units to support uh, the masticatory loads on the locators. And of course, the maxillary denture has to be made so that it can place pressure on the implants or on the locators and also have sufficient pressure on the palate to share some of that load. So I think locators are indicated in the maxilla, but you definitely have to be more careful when you're planning them than when you do in the denser mandibular bone. That's perfect. So we have another, I mean, a couple of questions here. There's another question uh, by Dr. Ahmed um, regarding the RPD case workup. If the anterior teeth were failing in the future and full arch prosthesis will be required, anterior implants would be placed, but would the prosthesis be retained by all implants 
or the posterior implants uh, would be sleepers regarding their position beyond the mental nerve and the mental flexure. Well, you know, this is something that we're seeing that's very interesting. We're starting to see patients that are coming in that have lost one or two teeth, they're getting a single implant. <clears throat> a couple of years later, they're losing another posterior tooth, they're getting another implant. And patients are coming in sometimes by the time they get to losing all their teeth, they've already got three, four, five implants in place. In regards to the case that we showed that has four posterior implants and six natural anterior teeth, to be honest, if that patient loses her six anterior teeth, I'm gonna recommend that the prosthodontist or the referring dentist just simply makes her a traditional denture and places those four implants in it. Again, four implants on the mandible. That's a fantastic restorative platform. Whenever I've placed four implants in the mandible in an appropriate position with some posterior load, I've never had a patient come back and ask for a fifth or sixth implant. So again, with that patient, I take out the six remaining teeth, not place any additional implants, give her a located supported prosthesis, or a fixed hybrid prosthesis, if that's what the patient was, was looking for. Um, okay, so we have another question from Dr. Chen. It says, is maxillary rotator uh, over denture better to have full pathic coverage or prevent air get in? Or to prevent air? Yeah. <clears throat> well, that's a very good question. And when you have a maxillary prosthesis without a palate that is supported on locators, Patients, they don't necessarily complain about air, but sometimes they do complain that food will get trapped in that area. Of course, when you chew food, many times you use your tongue to apply pressure to the palate to help you masticate and chew that food. Sometimes that can get displaced underneath uh, a palateless maxillary prosthesis. There's a lot of reasons, of course, to have a palate in your prosthesis, even if you have locators. There's function, there's phonetics, there's some minimized food getting trapped up there. And kind of as we discussed briefly earlier, you do get considerable support to the prosthesis, not only from the implants, but also from the palatal acrylic. Uh, so, so I always like to have a palate when I can. Every now and then you have that patient that comes in that just doesn't want to do a palate. And again, if they want a palateless prosthesis, you're probably going to need to either place six implants or place a bar. Okay, so there is uh, another question that you've answered previously in the chat or the Q&A box. Um, this question said, uh, should we reline the dentures at the same session or are we scanning the patients and the denture? Or is it step done prior to the, to the, uh, to the session? So the, the answer was is to reline either a few weeks ahead of the, of the workup or at the appointment, the most important thing is to fill the gaps and just make sure that there's no voids and spaces between the tissue, underlying tissue and the denture. So that answer uh, was done in the, in the, I mean, in the, in the box. Dr. Schmidt has another uh, question. It says, I noticed you did not place any immediate implants into extraction sites. What is your feeling regarding immediate placement into extraction sites? Boy, Dr. Schmidt, I tell you what, that is a really, really polarized question that could literally be one or two webinars on its own. Um, I do sometimes place immediate implants. Uh, sometimes I can get lucky and I can have a patient like we showed like Paul, where he does have five or six remaining teeth and we can place the dental implants around the pre-existing teeth. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with placing implants into uh, extraction sites. You do, of course, have a higher complication rate when you do that. Sometimes you may not get a very high insertional torque value as we discussed, which does correlate with implant stability. Sometimes when you place an immediate implant and you don't get the appropriate torque value, sometimes placing the, the immediate denture on the patient can put a lot of pressure on the implant, can cause it to fail. Sometimes you also get some periapical pathology or dental abscess at the bottom of the teeth and that can preclude immediate implant placement. The final thing is I do notice that the majority of the patients that we do the full mouth extractions on, they're typically not from things like decay, they're typically from gross and advanced periodontal disease. Whenever I take out those teeth on the, on the periodontally involved patients, 
in addition to placing the bone grafts to give myself a better ridge of bone to place the implants, I feel like I'm also significantly decreasing the periodontal bacteria in the patient's mouth. I always wonder about placing the immediate implants in a patient that is severely periodontally compromised because I'm always afraid some of that bacteria is going to stick around and jump on the implant and cause peri-implantitis. So you can, of course, and many people do immediately extract the teeth and place the dental implants. I like to go a little bit more conservative because I like to have a increased implant success rate. And I also like to really decrease that periodontal bacteria. Again, you are not wrong if you do immediate implants. I think it kind of comes down to a practitioner's uh, experience level and their comfort level. I do agree. And there is a final question here. It says, in case of no aviplasty done, what is the patient or what if the patient decides on having a fixed prosthesis rather than an overdenture, but there is no available restorative space for a fixed prosthesis? So what are the options you have here? Well, that's a very good question. I think that Dr. Hassan can help me out with that one a little bit. However, um, as we discussed, the minimum vertical restorative height for a locator is nine millimeters. The minimum height uh, for a hybrid is typically about 15. So what would need to happen is the prosthodontist or the restorative dentist will have to work with that patient on increasing the vertical dimension of occlusion, uh, kind of work with getting that patient into CR. Hopefully that patient will be able to tolerate increasing it depending on if you're doing one or two arches, an additional five to 10 millimeters of vertical height if they want to switch over to a fixed prosthesis. Yeah, and I do agree. In most of the cases we plan for an overdenture, uh, usually, again, as Dr. Haggerty mentioned in the beginning, we need to have at least nine millimeters of vertical restorative height. So we usually just plan to have more, and just in case in the future the patient decides to uh, switch to a fixed prosthesis. But um, yeah, and it also depends on the type of prosthesis you're going to be restoring the arch with. So if it's going to be acrylic, then of course, the more uh, the restorative height, the better, of course, just for the strength of the strength of the prosthesis. Uh, we could use other material that is, that are more um, um, just have more strength just to withstand the forces. And we can also, if the patient's planning on on doing the same thing on the top, we can just compensate with the opposing by just also increasing the amount of uh, vertical height as much as possible. When Dr. Hassan, just to throw in one more point. <clears throat> That's why it's nice to have to take out the teeth and put the patient in that immediate denture because exactly. that immediate denture will help to establish the vertical dimension of occlusion and the vertical restorative space. And even though nine millimeters is the minimum space that we need, most patients typically do end up with 12 to 15 millimeters of interarch space. So usually that is not going to be a problem unless you have a patient that's significantly overclosed. That is right. Um, there's a question here also from Dr. Chen that says with a uh, denture patient, uh, I mean, put too much pressure on the implants when we place healing abutments immediately. And I think you've, uh, you've actually just had one of these, uh, these slideshows showing that you usually just create a reservoir in the intaglio of the denture to just avoid having too much pressure falling on the implants if you're going to be placing locator attachment, I mean, um, um, healing abutments on them, right? That is absolutely correct. We will really want to take a, a large acrylic burr and core out those areas to minimize the pressure on it. Then I'll also say to the patients, you know, your denture right now, it's mostly cosmetic. When you go out in public, I want you to wear that denture. If you're sitting at home, don't wear it. If you're driving around in the car, don't wear it. For the first three or four weeks, we really want to have minimal pressure on those healing abutments. Back when I started to place dental implants 15 years ago, uh, we would wait six to nine months for a maxillary implant to osteointegrate before that implant was placed under functional loaded. The technology is so wonderful right now that based on your implant system, you may wait somewhere between four to eight weeks for that implant to be completely integrated because now the BIC or the bone to implant contact is so much greater than it was in the past. Another comment to Dr. Chin is, they may be wondering if we ever use cover screws. Of course, if you place a cover screw, then you can close the tissue over the top of the implant, and then you have no pressure from the intaglio surface of the denture um, on the implant itself. 
I probably haven't placed a cover screw, whether I'm doing a single implant, whether I'm doing two implants for a bridge or where, whether I'm doing five implants for locators or for a hybrid. I probably haven't placed a cover screw in about seven or eight years. Really like to place the implant, get that great initial uh, insertional torque value and then put the healing abutment on it. The other nice things about the healing abutments are if you use stock abutments, stock healing abutments, you've got multiple different shapes and heights of, of the healing abutment. So you could place a two or three millimeter tall healing abutment that would function somewhat like a cover screw and would place minimal pressure on the denture. You can also go ahead and create custom healing abutments and peak healing abutments as well. We typically do those with anterior teeth or single restorations and not with dentures, but you can do that as well to really customize it however you want. Okay, so there is um, another two questions actually from Dr. Yassine. Um, the first question says, do you recommend the usage of osteotomes to condense the bone in posterior uh, areas in the upper <coughs> jaw of D4 quality of bone? And I think the answer um, is yes. So usually what we recommend, as uh, Dr. Haggerty um, uh, might also just confirm, um, undersizing or underprepping the osteotomy just to create enough space for the implant to just condense the bone while you're just torquing it in. Um, you can use, of course, osteodensification tools just like um, osteotomes or burrs. Um, but yeah, uh, especially for the max of the posterior sites. What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Haggerty? Well, <clears throat> um, it is correct that you may take an osteotome and you may very gently and lightly or politely tap that into the posterior maxilla to really thicken the bone. That is a great way to do it. Uh, however, um, what we can also do is undersize the osteotomy with the drill and use a tapered implant. If you are gonna go ahead and place a 4.1 diameter implant, your final drill would be a 3.5. If while you're drilling, if you have really soft bone, use your 2.8 drill, stop, place your 4.1 millimeter diameter implant, skip the 3.5 millimeter diameter implant. That way you are undersizing the osteotomy, you'll get a higher insertional torque value. You do of course have to worry about doing that in the mandible because you're worrying about pressure necrosis and things like that. But in the maxilla, yes, you can do that. Dr. Hassan had also mentioned that there are of course certain tools. Um, I don't like to necessarily talk about products, but there is one that is called uh, Versa Solutions. They use a osseo identification system where they actually drill the, the burr uh, in reverse. And that really thickens the area and performs your osseo densification. So there are multiple things you can do. Yes, they are advised if you get into some mandibular, I'm sorry, into some posterior maxillary bone that's very soft, or if you know it ahead of time by looking at the Hounsfield units on your CT scan. Um, the second question Dr. Yassine has um, is why you did not put xenograft bone in the sockets after extracting the anterior lower four teeth? Well, the reason for that, of course, is because those areas will heal fine on their own and, and those areas didn't have any dental implants in them. Now, if I was doing immediate implants, you know, if I had 1.5 millimeters or greater space between the implant and the buccal or lingual plate of bone, then yes, I would place some xenograft and I would, I would graft that gap. But because we didn't have any implants in the areas where the teeth were extracted on Paul's case, that was the gentleman from the, from the PowerPoint, those areas will heal fine on their own. They won't have any pressure on them by the implants. It's just an additional step that's, that's not indicated. Okay, so there's another question here uh, says regarding Dr. Chen's question, would the healing abutment's presence benefit the implants integration with progressive loading of those implants? You know, I don't think so in the sense, that's a great question. And yes, of course, that is kind of how the whole process works is the implants are stimulated, they uh, exert a dynamic pressure on the bone, that dynamic pressure, it's 
It uh, preserves the bone. That's why if you don't have any load on the alveolar process, you do get disuse atrophy. But because we're only allowing the implants to heal for six to eight weeks prior to receiving their locator attachments, Probably not. To be honest with you, the reason why I like to place the healing abutments versus the cover screws is it's easier for me. I don't have to schedule that patient to come back for an uncover procedure. If patients really like not having to come back for that uncover procedure, because you have to numb the patient, remove tissue, they have to heal a second time. So I think that's more of the reason for patient comfort and practitioner time. I think that's why we're moving away from cover screws. So Dr. Yassine also has another question. Um, if for any reason oronasal or, or sinus fistula happened due to the implantology or extraction of the upper molar, um, how will you close this fistula? Um, can you plug well, a, a centrifugal <clears throat> xenograft? Well, that's a good question. And of course, we're talking about a nasal communication and a uh, maxillary sinus communication. I'm going to first start by saying that before we use guided surgery, that would happen all the time. Uh, not all the time, but it would happen every now and then. Now with guided surgery, we discuss in that PowerPoint that it gives us the availability to significantly control the depth of our implant osteotomy and implant placement. You wanna try really, really hard to not get a nasal perforation because that can be very difficult to close. You would start by removing that dental implant potentially placing a collagen plug and then placing your xenograft in that area. You'd place the collagen plug to ensure that none of the xenograft or bone graft as it was condensed went up into the nasal cavity. If you do all that and if you still have a chronic oral nasal communication, then that will require some relatively delicate intranasal flaps in the operating room to close. That's actually a very difficult uh, case to take care of. The posterior maxillary sinus, in some respects, that's a lot easier. If you get a perforation, you can just simply take out the implant, place a collagen plug and a bone graft. They typically heal fine on their own. Whether you're placing a dental implant or whether you are extracting a tooth, if you have a non-smoker and if you have a one, two, three millimeter uh, sinus perforations, they typically heal fine on their own without doing anything. I would of course place them on an antibiotic such as Augmentin and I would also give them specific nasal precautions. The key with the, with the maxillary sinus is you wanna prevent that area from being infected. If that maxillary sinus becomes secondarily infected then as purulence and things like that and pressure develop in the sinus, it's going to look for an opportunistic gravity de dependent means to drain and that will be through your implant osteotomy. Should the area become secondarily infected and should the maxillary sinus become 100% obliterated with tissue with infection, you're probably going to need an ENT referral so that that sinus can be curated and lavaged and then it may have to be closed either through a intraoral buccal advancement flap, a buccal fat advancement flap, or through the sinus itself. So th those are complicated questions that are, again, just a key reason to use guided surgery so you can make sure that you can avoid those structures by a millimeter or two. Okay, and uh, there is another question here that says, on the tissue level posterior implants, on the last case, you used what size locator cuff height, one millimeter? Um, well, because I'm an oral surgeon, um, that is up to the restorative dentist or the prosthodontist. However, typically you'd like to have about 1.5 to 2 millimeters of that locator extending above the tissue. That's about how much you need to sufficiently engage your locator housing. If you have a really, really long locator abutment, then that's going to create a lot lot of torsional and bending forces on that locator abutment that can cause the implant to fail. It's also going to really wear out your locator housing and your locator retention ring. So you really want about 1.5 millimeters or two millimeters above the tissue to prevent those abnormal uh, bending and torsional forces. Okay. Um... Don't think we have any other questions. I think we're done with all the questions. Um, 
I would like to thank you all for attending today. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Haggerty. Oh, no, I just said those are all just great questions. I hope that they we are. answered them. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I would just like to add before we uh, we close this, um, your CE credits will be sent to your email next week. And Dr. Haggerty, I thank you so much for this very informative lecture. Um, it was great. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. Do um, you have any words, Dr. Haggerty, before we, uh, we end this? No, just guys, I can't stress enough how absolutely wonderful guided surgery is. It's so much better than back in the old days where we had to flap everything and, and place the implants somewhat blindly. The guided implant placement has just really transformed my practice, decreased my stress level, increased our implant accuracy level. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. If you're using it, continue to use it. Um, and if you're new to it, definitely look into it. You're gonna really love it. I totally agree. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Yassin. And um, we'll see you um, in the future with more uh, lectures. Sounds great, everybody. Have a safe weekend. Thank you.